All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our new and now series uh, featuring HubSpot product updates for October 2023. Uh, my name is Alexis. If this is your first time joining in, just want to welcome you and thank you guys for showing up. Uh, in this new and now series, we'll be covering new updates released from HubSpot uh, that we're most excited about and giving you some real use case examples. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to know exactly like, hmm, what am I going to use that feature for? So we kind of break that stuff down for you um, and give you these use cases that are designed to really kind of help take your portal to the next level. So we do host these webinars every single month. So we hope that you'll stay connected with us and join us in our future events. Coming up today, we're going to review um, kind of in three segments our biggest, most exciting new features and use cases, um, including one I was particularly excited for, which is the same object association. So Tyler's going to dive deep into that, but that is a major update that I think tons of you are going to be very excited to see. Uh, and then we'll dig into some smaller, um, but still good updates, things you might have missed. Um, but they definitely deserve some recognition. So we'll go through some of those. Um, and of course, we'll have our Q&A segment at the end to answer any of your questions. So feel free to just jot those down and send those over um, as soon as you think of them. And we'll go through as many as we can at the end of today. And then if you are not familiar with Simple Strat, uh, we are a diamond level solutions partner that helps you get more out of HubSpot. So we offer um, all kinds of different types of support, um, free support for purchasing assistance. If you're you know, looking into HubSpot and you want to learn more about the different tiers and what you should be um, looking for to, to purchase or for upgrades. Um, we also help with like doing portal audits and fixing your HubSpot. If you inherited um, a portal maybe that has a lot of things going on, you're not really sure where to start or what might need to be fixed. Um, as well as just implementing a lot of the new features that we're going to be talking about today. So we can help you with all of those different things. Um, and then lastly, we also have lots of education. So hosting these um, webinars every single month, as well as our HubSpot Hacks YouTube channel for tips, tricks, and tutorials. So I will kick this over to Tyler. Um, he is our host of this webinar, as well as our HubSpot Hacks channel, and he'll be taking you guys through all of today's fun content. Yeah, thanks, Alexis. Welcome, everyone. I see a lot of familiar faces on the attendees list and a lot of new ones as well. So uh, if you are a returning HubSpot Hacks webinar watcher, thanks for coming back. And if you're brand new, welcome, welcome. Um, this month, HubSpot was very busy with updates, as they always are. So uh, if you've been to one of these before, you know that we pack quite a bit into this next hour. Um, just ask any questions that you'd like uh, in that Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, and Alexis will help me get through as many of those as possible here at the end. But we will jump into some of these updates. All right. So if you're new here, uh, there's going to be some kind of standard formatting that we do on each slide. So what you're going to see for kind of the next few updates that we have is the name of the update and then who it's available to. So it'll tell you whether it's in public beta uh, or live and new this month. We're also including, I think we've got one private beta in here. Uh, we'll also tell you a little bit more about how you can enroll in private betas. HubSpot made that uh, much more accessible this month. So we'll we'll kind of break that down. Below that, it'll tell you what hubs that the update is available to. So marketing hub, sales hub, service hub, et cetera. And then what tier of those hubs you would need to take advantage of that. So the first update that we have here is calling as a channel in the inbox. Uh, that's available on sales and service hubs. That's available at the pro or enterprise level. Uh, so the way that this works is it works with inbound calling. So you need a HubSpot phone number that's set up for inbound calling. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to have an inbound call and have that ring up to 10 people on your team simultaneously. Uh, the people that it's ringing does, do have to have paid seats. They have to have a professional enterprise seat in these sales or service hubs. And then they're eligible to be selected to have this phone number ring to them uh, on those inbound calls. So the kind of most uh, most common use case for this, the most obvious use case for this is routing it to the correct rep. And that could be either on the marketing or sales team. So let's say you've got a phone number for support. A lot of people have that. And you want, instead of that 
being going to a specific person or having to use a, a different integration with your phone system. You want that to just be able to go to a bunch of different reps at the same time. Next available rep can answer that call. And you can now do this natively in HubSpot with this update. Same thing for sales. So maybe you've got a sales phone number on your website or in some sales collateral or something like that. They can call in and just be routed to the next available salesperson. So as I mentioned, it can ring up to 10 reps at a time. Uh, you can assign more reps than that. So if you've got a team that's larger than 10, you can assign the, the number to more reps than that, but it's only going to ring up to 10 at a time. And it's going to be based on their availability. So be able to set working hours. And then each rep will also be able to say whether they're available or not. So if a rep is you know, taking a lunch break or busy with you know maybe uh, working with email cases or chat cases, they can mark that they're uh, unavailable for those calls as well. And then it would go um, only ring the people that are available. And it also allows you to quickly follow up via email from the same inbox thread. So that's kind of the, the beauty of having this work inside of HubSpot's conversations inbox is that the conversations inbox is really one repository for um, for, for calling, chat, email, WhatsApp, Facebook messages. It all goes to one place. And so if you get a call and you know, you're working through that case, you need to follow up on that call, you can directly from that same thread reply to that same customer as long as they're associated to a contact that has an email address. You can, auto, you can send an email follow-up just right there from the same thread. Um, they, I don't have this update in this because I literally just found out that the that the beta went live like five minutes ago. Um, but HubSpot is going to be rolling out something called a help desk, which is similar to the inbox. It kind of, kind of lives a little bit closer to tickets in the conversation inbox. This does work there as well. Uh, so stay tuned next month for, for a lot more information about help desk and, and how that's helping uh, HubSpot kind of streamlined some of these, especially support conversations. This also allows you to do a couple other things. So, so one of the things that allows you to do that, that I think uh, people that have kind of embraced HubSpot's inbound calling may be excited about is it allows you to reduce the number of phone numbers that the number of HubSpot phone numbers that you need to have and share with your uh, share with your support people, your customers for support and, and your potential leads, your potential buyers there. So you don't need to have as many HubSpot phone numbers when you can have one phone number ring multiple reps, right? And as you may know, HubSpot does have some limits depending on the, whether on professional or enterprise, you're limited with how many phone numbers are included in that. And then of course you can purchase more, but this will help you sort of limit the number of phone numbers that you need. You may not need, you likely don't need a phone number, a HubSpot phone number for every single sales rep and support rep on your team. And you can just make things a little bit easier for your customers and for your team that's sharing out phone numbers. So, you know, one number on your on your website can route to your full sales team. Uh, team members can share a non-personalized number in their email signatures, business cards, collateral. So, you know, if you've got a signature for your support reps and they have a phone number at the bottom of that signature and you want to make sure your customers can easily call back and, and make sure that they're going to connect with somebody as quickly as possible, you can use these shared phone numbers in those places. And then another thing that I think makes that this tool makes exciting and make, makes much easier to do is you can manage missed calls quickly. So if you maybe have a small team or there's a day where you're just getting inundated with support calls or something, maybe something went down, hopefully not, um, then you can manage those missed calls much more easily, again, because it all lives in that conversations inbox. So unanswered phone calls will prompt uh, the, the caller to leave a voicemail. And then what happens is those missed calls create a thread in the conversations inbox. And that's, that's an unassigned thread that you can then assign to specific users. Uh, so the next available user, whether that be a support rep or call rep, can go in there, easily assign that to themselves, and then either call back or email that customer, depending on what's, uh, what's needed there. Um, and I will note that Unfortunately, it is it is a little bit not buggy but clunky. Uh, if you're going to call back a a visitor that doesn't have a contact associated with them, it's it's possible it just takes a couple extra clicks because how HubSpot's outbound calling is set up right now is it does need to be associated does have to have a phone number associated with a contact. So just note that, that that's something that's a little bit clunky right now that I do expect HubSpot to to iron out a bit. I think they're going to get some feedback. Uh, on that piece of it, just note that, that that's kind of the only place in our testing that we notice that mm, maybe this isn't quite perfect yet. Definitely doable, just takes a few more clicks than you might be used to if you're used to some calling integrations, for example.
All right. Admin default views in the ad view modal. Wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of words that probably mean very little to a lot of people. A lot of the updates this month are kind of like that, like same object customers, uh, same object associations that I know uh, a lot of HubSpot partners uh, that that I'm friends with are very excited about, and it doesn't really mean anything to a lot of the customers. Hopefully, it means something today. Uh, this is one of those updates. So, really, what this is allowing you to do is it's allowing you as an admin in your portal to recommend shared views or saved views to your users. So saved views are, think about anytime you go to your contact list or your company list and you have a saved view of filters. So maybe you're looking at contacts by state, for example. This allows admins on your team, management on your team to suggest views that really all your users or a, a good number of your users should use or may want to use. So this is kind of an update to an existing feature. You've been able to do this for a little while with, new users. So you could kind of set up as a default when a new user, uh, when you set up a new user in your HubSpot portal, what views do they see by default? What this allows you to do is this allows you to, to sort of recommend and surface views very easily for your existing users. And so what it's going to look like is exactly on the screen here. When they go to click that add a view on any, any list view um, in HubSpot, so this would be contacts, companies, deals, tickets, custom objects, if you have that, what they're going to see is a new column called admin promoted. And so these are those views that you as an admin are creating and surfacing for them. So a couple ways that, that you might use this. Uh, so, so how you get to it is, is not super intuitive. So one, this is kind of how you would create those. So you would open up a list view yourself as an admin. So contacts, for example, click all views. And then there's across the top, you'll see default views. And then you can edit your defaults there. So it's the same exact process. Setting up default views for new users is the exact same process as recommending uh, recommending views for existing users. The exact same place, exact same process. And so some places, uh, some ideas for lists, or excuse me, views that you might want to surface for your users. These are going to vary depending on your company and, and uh, how you're using HubSpot. But some common ones. Maybe you've got unassigned leads that are up for grabs. So maybe the way that you assign leads is salespeople just grab the next available lead that they're not working. You can show a view of all of the leads that are unassigned. You can show leads or customers that haven't been contacted in a certain amount of time. A list of current customers is, is a view that's pretty common in pretty much all of our client portals. Uh, leads that Maybe leads that have visited the website today. Uh, so that's a, a list of people that you might wanna follow up with, take action on them. Uh, leads over a certain lead score. And again, it's not just contacts that you can do this with. So maybe you maybe you're looking at some deals, some tickets, so maybe deals past their close date or tickets that, that have been open for too long. Uh, so lots of different use cases for these views that you might want to make sure are, are readily available across your team. Feedback submissions tagging. So I don't know how many of you guys are using the uh, feedback surveys that live in Service Hub. I know we just rolled them out for our team. It is a great way to get that feedback from customers, clients in our case, uh, without having to go to another tool like a SurveyMonkey or something like that, and be able to, to not only just use one tool to send that survey and to get that data, but be able to act on that data very easily across HubSpot. And so what this update is, is this allows you to add a tag to the feedback responses that you're getting from customers on those surveys. Now, one note on this, if you're familiar with deal tags or, or ticket tags that already exist, those colored tags, this is a little bit different. This is, as of right now in the beta, 100% manual. So what this would be, you know, if you're getting... Uh, if you're getting responses and you know exporting that out to Excel or kind of manually categorizing the, that feedback and, and needing to kind of report on that or take action on that and, and using multiple tools, this is HubSpot's way of allowing you to streamline that and kind of draw easier insight across all of your feedback submissions. And I'll give you some examples of, of how to use this here. So really the example, the, the, the way you're going to use this is to categorize your feedback so you can take action on it. And so you might tag specific feedback responses that require a follow-up. So maybe you send out a satisfaction survey for a current plus customer, current client, and they weren't very happy. Uh, and you want to definitely make sure that you follow up on that feedback to, to resolve their issue. You might tag that to make sure that that gets surfaced for follow-up. Maybe you're going to a tag feedback that's particularly useful for a certain team. So maybe you uh, want to make sure that a couple of responses 
they mention product bugs or things they liked about products. You want to make sure that 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 those particular survey responses are shared with your product team. So you might tag those for your product team. Uh, maybe you're just tagging it by satisfaction level. So maybe you've got a couple different questions about how satisfied they are. Maybe it's not as simple as just one question, or maybe it's an open-ended question and you need to kind of manually go in there and say, okay, they're, they're satisfied, they're not satisfied. And so you can easily report on that, take action on that. Uh, maybe you want to tag feedback that mentions something you something else that you want to track. So, you know, something specific you want to track. So, for example, maybe you've got a software product and you just rolled out a new feature and you want to see, are people noticing this new feature? Are they liking it? And so you want to tag all of your feedback responses that mention this feature. Uh, and then the last one, and this was one that, that I kind of like, it really shows you how you can use this tool in conjunction with other tools in, um, in HubSpot but using it to add context to your customers. So, right, these, these feedback surveys are like are often coming from customers and you can use what they're saying there to add context to them. So uh, the example we have here is, let's say you run a coffee shop and you wanna know, you know, it's good for you to know which of your coffee shop customers really like your pastries. And so anytime somebody mentions, you know, hey, I love this pastry in, in a feedback survey, you just tag them with, with a pastry lover tag. And I'll give you an example in the next one about how you can use that. So you can also use this to streamline reporting. Obviously, once you have all these tags, is the insight that these tags give you that there's a real value of this tool. And so you can create saved views of feedback submissions by tags. So the way that feedback submissions live in HubSpot, just like a list of contacts or a list of deals, what you have is a list of feedback submissions. And you can create a saved view based on, you know, the tag contains, that it contains this tag or it doesn't contain this tag. You can create a view of all of those feedback submissions. But I think where it gets really, really gets really powerful is you can create lists of customers or contacts that, that are um, that the the contacts that get into that list are based on the tags on their feedback surveys. And so, you know, we had that example of the pastry lovers. Uh, the the image on screen here is showing how you would build a list of contacts that are associated to a feedback survey so that, that left feedback on a survey that you tagged as pastry lovers. So now we've got a list of all the people that love our pastries and maybe we've got uh, you know a special sale on pastries or a new pastry that we're coming out with and we wanna email everybody that we know loves our pastries. Now we can use this list to email them and now you've got that power of having all those tools on one platform and really being able to, to draw insight from those feedback submissions. You can also create bar chart reports or any other kind of reports that you want. Uh, you can add those to dashboards. You can have those automatically sent to stakeholders, just like any other report. But these tags make it easy to categorize those, those feedback submissions in those reports so that you can get that visualization and get that insight from them. All right, custom properties and description fields for lists. So the one I just went through was, was all very Service Hub specific, right? So you're not using Service Hub, that might not have been super relevant to you. This one I think is relevant to just about anybody using HubSpot. So it's it's in public beta right now, so you have to enroll, uh, but it is available at all hubs, all tiers. If you have lists, you have this. And essentially what they allowed you to do is add custom properties to your list. And they also added a description field to your list. Uh, you have the option to create its custom properties. So you, you establish what properties you want associated with your list. And you can also customize the, the sort of form, like what you see on the screen here, of what a user needs to enter, what a user can enter into those properties when they're creating a list. So this update was one of them that, that felt like a big update. I know uh, on my LinkedIn, all the people I'm, I'm connected with, the HubSpot partners were like kind of excited about it. And then like, the next week it was like, okay, but how do we use this? Uh, and so this is one of those that I think is not very intuitive on how to use, but once you start seeing use cases for it, I think it kind of snowballs. It's like, oh my gosh, this is actually super powerful. So what it allows you to do is organize your list. Hopefully, uh, it's one of the things we've been recommending for a long time, you're using naming conventions on things like lists and workflows. Naming conventions are great. They're a great way to allow you to, to categorize um, and, and release easily find the lists, workflows, et cetera, that you need. But naming conventions are, they sort of exist because properties didn't exist, right? They sort of exist because that was, we were trying to pack a whole bunch of different types of information in the one field that we had for lists, which was the name. Uh, and now we can replace or 
maybe you don't completely replace your naming conventions, but you are able to make your naming conventions sort of less involved because you have these properties now. So the great thing about properties is that they're enforceable, right? A naming convention is not enforceable. Uh, you might have an operating procedure that, that dictates that people use a naming convention, but at the end of the day, if I want to create a naming convention or create a list and name it whatever I want to, there's nothing in HubSpot that, that stops me from doing that. With properties, you can require specific properties when I create a list. So I'm not able to create that list without filling in the information that we need to have filled in on that list. It also eliminates misspellings and inconsistencies. So, uh, you know, even the best intentions around using a name convention, I may accidentally have a typo in there, uh, or I may not exactly remember what I'm supposed to put in there. And so it's slightly inconsistent. And that kind of takes away naming conventions ability to allow you to easily find them through search and things like that. So it takes all that away. You can have drop down properties and checkbox properties, just like any other type of property in HubSpot. And it also doesn't make your users rely on memory or documentation. They don't have to remember what a naming convention is or, or new users, you know, go back and refer to this documentation that lives somewhere else all the time to remember what they need to put in the naming convention. It's just right there in front of them. These are the properties that you need to complete when you are creating a list. So what might be some properties that you would add? How might these actually be valuable to you in when you're using and administrating lists in HubSpot? Uh, some ideas for this. Uh, so maybe you want to categorize your lists by business function. This was a, a very popular usage of folder structures and naming conventions already with lists, but maybe you've got, you know, maybe you keep it simple. Maybe it's marketing sales support. Maybe it's a little bit more granular for, for your company. If you've got, um, if you've got kind of more breakout in your business functions, but you can now sales can easily go in and see all the lists that refer to them by filtering based on that property. Uh, maybe campaign name, Asset type, the list supports. So a lot of lists, most of your lists are really there to support other assets. So they're, you know, a list that you're going to email to or a list that triggers a workflow or that is involved with workflows. Uh, so maybe you're you're wanting to easily be able to see the, you know, all of the lists that are there for your email marketing, for example. Uh, maybe it's about the place in the buyer's journey. So maybe, you know, everybody, all these lists are related to uh, the awareness stage of our buyer's journey. All, all these are related to the decision stage if you're very inbound marketing. And, and that's kind of how you have your HubSpot set up. That can be a great way to divide up your lists. Um, estimated sunset date. This, I think, is like a very specific use case. I saw somebody talking about it on LinkedIn that I really like. So I know one of the things that we see when we audit portals all the time is we go in there and we see lists and there's just a ton of lists. And a, a large portion of them aren't actually being used now. Maybe they were used for, you know, some sort of outbound campaign five years ago. And so oftentimes when we create lists, we know that we don't need this list forever. We need this list to support something we're doing over the next month. And so we can put an estimated sunset date in there. You know, we don't think we'll need this list after December 31st. And so if you're doing kind of regular internal portal audits and regular cleaning up of your list, this can be a great way, you know, show me all of the lists that are past the estimated sunset date. And can we get rid of any of these to, to kind of keep our, our list of lists nice and clean? Uh, and then the description. So uh, help future you. I can't tell you how many times we get help future you and also future colleagues for when you may no longer be with your company. Maybe you've moved on or moved up uh, and you've got somebody else responsible for managing lists. Uh, using descriptions is a great way to, to make that process a lot easier uh, and make future you not have to remember, why did I create this list two years ago? Can I delete this now that we're doing an audit? And, and it doesn't seem like we're using this list, but, but can I get rid of it now? Um, so what I, what I would recommend is going back to your existing list now that you have this description property and adding descriptions. Not going to be the, the most fun experience for you, depending on how many lists you have, but it's a great thing to pair with an audit and be able to clean out some of those, some of those lists you may not be using anymore. Um, and if you're going to take advantage of those properties, I recommend that you do. You might as well go ahead and update those properties while you're at it. And the other thing that I would recommend is requiring descriptions for new lists. So I mentioned that you can set any property to be required for those new lists. You can also set the description property to be required for those new lists. So I have kind of real quick in here how you would do that. You go to settings, objects, lists will appear under objects now that's new. Uh, and you click customize the create list form. 
you'll see some lists, some properties that are um, that are already defined by HubSpot. So list name, processing type, object type, and description you'll see already in there. Then any custom properties you've added. So in our case, business function here. And what you can do is you can just hover over description, click that little asterisk, and that'll make it required for anybody that's creating a list in the future to add a description, which is something that we recommend. Random split branch and workflows. Another one of those things is like, what is that? Um, but for people that have tried to do any sort of testing and workflows beyond just throwing an A-B test email in there and testing two different versions of an email, you'll know that, it, that it's kind of hard to do that. There's, there's some workarounds to do it. Um, none of them are great. And so uh, what this random splits in and workflows allows you to do is it allows you to do some testing and some other things that we'll talk about here. It is marketing hub only. Uh, and you do need to have access to workflows on the marketing app, so pro or enterprise level. The way that it works, a lot of the ex examples that I'm going to show you are going to be two branches. You can add, I don't think it's unlimited, but it's a very high number of, of branches that you can have. And it is going to do an equal percentage between them. So you've got two branches, it's going to go 50 50. If it's got three, it's going to be 33 33 33. Uh, there is no overriding that. So it is an equal split between the branches. So a couple of ways to use this. The easiest one or the most obvious one is going to be A-B testing. And so what you'll do there is you'll add a random split branch and test variations between the branches. Just like all testing, we recommend don't test everything at once. Test kind of one variation at a time. Uh, so you might test, you know, how does how do people respond if they get an email follow up versus an SMS follow up? We've, we've talked about in previous months that HubSpot now has the power to send text messages natively inside of HubSpot uh, workflows. You may also be using integration already, uh, but you can say, okay, these guys we're gonna send an email to, these people we're gonna send an SMS message to and see what the difference is in response rate. Different delay lengths. So that's what we've got on the screen here. You know, on, on the left-hand side, we're delaying seven days between the first and second nurture email. On the right-hand side, we're delaying three. So what effect does that have on people taking the action that we want them to take? Uh, maybe it's the order of nurturing emails. So, you know, what happens if we send a case study before this guide or the guide before the case study? How does that affect how people interact with their nurturing sequences? Now, I will say reporting on this is still very challenging. There is no easy way to report on how did branch A do versus branch B? This A-B testing use case is the most common use case for this. So I do think we will see this very, very soon. As of right now, it's very difficult. There is no place to go into the analyze tab or the goals tab inside of your workflows and see branch A did this, branch B did this. There are a couple ways that you can still do this. They, they do get a little bit more advanced. So this might be something that you might have talked with a HubSpot admin or us afterwards on, on the best way to do this, but a couple things you can do. So Sometimes some analytics you can see directly in the workflow. So this example was a workflow that, that's not being used right now. So there is nothing in here, but you can see things like click rate on an email directly inside of that workflow building tool. And so you might be able to just look at those actions and get a sense of which one's working better. You can also create static lists. So you might say, you know, workflow XYZ branch A and put all the contacts that went through that first branch the first step in that branch is to add them to that list. Branch B, you've got a, sep a separate list and you add all the contacts as the first step in that branch to that list. Now you've got two different lists of people. List A is everybody went through branch A. List B is everybody went through branch B. Branch B. And so now you can build HubSpot reports around the difference between those lists in terms of what actions they took or didn't take or how quickly they took an action. So you can start to get a sense of which branch is working better. You can also do similar things with properties. So um, I think this could get unwieldy with properties very quickly if you're doing a lot of this testing. Uh, I think lists would be better there, but another option would be, you know, you stamp a property, um, at a custom property as the first step in this branch. And, you know, the property might literally say branch A or branch B. And again, that just allows you to separate those contacts out when you're building your reporting. Again, I, I do think HubSpot will improve on this uh, very quickly. Uh, but as of right now, those are some of the options that you have to get a little more clarity in terms of which branch is actually outperforming. You can also, so that, that's like the most obvious one. A couple other interesting use cases that I've seen um, this be used for. One of them is weighted routing. So there's a lot of different reasons that you might want to use weighted routing, but the way, the way that this works is you would either use stacked random branches. So what I mean by that is you've got one random branch that's 50-50, and then on branch A, you add another random branch. So now you've got 25, 25, and 50. That makes sense. So you're adding branches to make them kind of unequal percentages. 
And you might do this. So maybe you've got full-time reps and part-time reps and you want full-time reps to get twice as many leads as your part-time reps. Or maybe you've got uh, some high-performing reps or an A team or, or somebody that just moves through moves through leads very quickly, senior reps versus new reps, for example. Any reason that you would want to want one group of people to get more leads or more objects that there are other types of in tickets, any, any kind of rounding that you're doing um, than the other. And so one of the ways that to do it is to do those stacked, um, those stacked random split branches, like I said. The other way to do it is, is right here, we just on the screen, we've got one random split branch and we're, we've got, we're using the rotates record owner um, action. You can see on the left-hand side, we're, so we were splitting those leads 50-50. And then the left-hand side, we're splitting those leads 50-50 again. On the right-hand side, we're just we're split, giving them to one user. Um, so that's an, an example of, of another way to, to kind of do this routing. And then another use case that I think is interesting, it's a little bit less exact, um, but you can use it to avoid hitting like daily or weekly limits that your tools might have. So some tools, uh, if you're using um, Sales Hub Enterprise, you can use workflows to automatically enroll people in sequences. We know that there are some limits to sequences in terms of how many emails you can send through a sequence from HubSpot each day. And so if you've got a workflow that a lot of people are going to be hitting that workflow in a short period of time, like uh, in, in a single day, for example, you might want to stagger that a bit so that you're not hitting those limits. Another thing is uh, a lot of third-party SMS tools have daily limits for, for text messaging. So again, you might stagger those a bit. Um, and it's, again, it's great for, if you're gonna have a large number of enrollments that are kind of hitting in a short period of time, you need to divide them out. Uh, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna use random split branches plus delays. So in this example, we've got two branches, branch on the left gets enrolled in a sequence right away. Branch number two is gonna get enrolled in a sequence a day later. So it just kind of staggers them a bit to help you sort of avoid hitting them. It's not an exact science, uh, but it can be an effective way to just kind of get a little more mileage out of those limits that you have. All right, this is the one that Alexis is excited about. This is the one that uh, basically crashed my LinkedIn feed with, with all of the partners talking about this. I will say as somebody that works across many portals, this has been something that we've been waiting for for a very long time. Um, there are a lot of reasons why you might wanna do this, but essentially the way that this works is you, so you've always been able to associate objects, not about always, but at least for a very long time, associate objects of different types. So think about uh, associating all the contacts that work for a company, associating those together, right? But you have not been able to associate objects of the same type. So if I've got contact A and contact B and I want to associate them together, I can't do that through a direct association. If I've got company A and company B, they did roll out child relationships a while ago, but if parent child doesn't really work for the data model that you have or the data model that you need, then there's no other way to associate two companies together. And so people were using all kinds of workarounds. Um, they were sort of living without it. Uh, they were upgraded enterprise to get access to custom objects, uh, which you still may need. But this, I think, eliminates a lot of the custom object requirements uh, that the people are using those, them for today and unlocks a lot of things that you can do with, with associations in HubSpot. So um, some ways that you might use this or reasons you might use this. So there is a lot, and it really depends on your business and, and how your data model looks, how you work with your customers and partners. Uh, but one of them that's, that's very common is associating contacts within the same household. So maybe you've got a B2C um, product or service where you're selling to consumers. And so you don't really use the company's object or the company's object doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to use. But you do want to say, okay, I've got these three people that live together in the same household. And I want to be able to, to mark that. A lot of times people were using companies as kind of a workaround to do that and doing manual associations and all these things. It was a huge pain. Now we can just say contact A, contact B, contact C, all associated together in the same household. Uh, you can also associate referring contacts with the contact they referred. So we've got Michael Scott here, and we can see on the right-hand side, he's associated to Dwight Schrute, who referred Michael Scott to us. So now we can easily see, okay, this contact uh, was referred by this contact. And so that kind of informs any conversations that we would have, any sort of referral compensation or incentives that we would have. We could also hop into Dwight Schrute's contact record and see all the people that he's referred. So we can easily identify, you know, the, the contacts that are really influencing more business that are referring a lot more business our way. So I think this is a great use case. Uh, you can associate original deals and renewals or upsells. So maybe you've got this original sale 
And every time you have a renewal deal or an upsell deal, it'd be really handy to be able to click into that first deal and see, you know, some of that, that those first conversations or the first, um, the information about that first deal. Well, now we can just associate those two so that inside of that renewal deal, we can easily see that first deal on the right-hand side, click into it and get all the information that we need. Um, there's also all, uh, all kinds of different reasons that you might want to associate different company types. So different, uh, different, different types of companies to each other. So vendors and clients, maybe you run a partner program, so partners and clients, resellers and customers. So if you've got kind of a, um, a three, a three tiered go to market strategy there. Um, again, this is a place where a lot of people were having to use custom objects and upgraded enterprise. And now we can just use the company object, which has a lot of stuff built in, just have a, a, a sort of a type drop down so we can easily segment between our clients and our vendors, for example, it's just a one property instead of a whole different object type, and we can just associate those together. Um, you can add association labels. So there's two types of association labels. One type of association label means they both get the same label. So, um, you know, if, if it's, uh, so this Michael Scott um, and Dwight Schrute example here, maybe the label, uh, if there was, if you're just using a, a one-way label, it'd just be referred. So Dwight Schrute at the very bottom, it says referred by that would just say referred. If I was in Dwight Schrute's contact profile, Michael Scott would just say referred. The other type is a two-way association label, which is going to give you a lot more insight for a lot of your use cases. So for example, if we just had that, you know, if Michael Scott said referred and Dwight Schrute said referred, all we would know is that there a referral happened, but we wouldn't know who referred who. So in this example, we have referred and referred by. And so we can see that Michael Scott was referred by Dwight Schrute. And if we open up Dwight Schrute's, we can see that Michael Scott was referred. Um, and so we can easily see kind of the difference in the relationship there. Uh, on the previous screen, we saw student and teacher. So that was one association with a two-way label there. So we could easily differentiate that. That does require you to have a pro or enterprise level subscription, at least on one hub, to be able to do those association labels. But if you have that, it really adds a lot more kind of clarity and power to these associations between the objects. And you can use those association labels when you're doing lists, reporting, workflows. Uh, so you can you can very easily kind of take those relationships between those same objects and, and put them into action. So if you wanted to create a, a list of contacts, all the contacts that have a um, have a referred label, so all of your, it'd be all of your contacts that refer to other people, and you might want to send them a thank you email or, or um, enroll them in uh, some sort of campaign to incentivize more, refer more referrals, et cetera. So really powerful association labels. And I think that two-way association is going to be especially popular with these same object associations. All right, so those were all the updates that we have that we're gonna go through specific use cases for. We've got a lot more updates for you that we're gonna go through a little bit quicker because the use cases, the, the rest of the updates that we'll have, the use cases are just a little bit more obvious or it's just an update for you. Uh, but I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask you for a huge favor. Uh, so we do, my goal with these work, with these webinars, our, our goals with these webinars is really to make this the best and easiest place for you to not only learn about HubSpot updates as they come out, but really learn, uh, you know, creative and practical ways that you can use these um, these updates and, and really get more value out of HubSpot, make HubSpot a more valuable tool for you every single month. And so there's two things that, that I need your help with in doing that. One, at the end of the webinar, it's going to automatically take you to a survey. If you've been to these webinars in the past, uh, you've, you've probably seen that's a very, very short survey. If there's anything that we can do to make these more valuable, more, more powerful for you, please do let us know. And the other thing is if we're succeeding in our goal, if these webinars are a great tool for you uh, to get access to those updates and, and get inspiration about how you can use HubSpot in new ways to deliver value to your business, please share it. Um, you know, you can forward our HubSpot hacks emails that promote these webinars. Uh, you can just tell a, a colleague or a peer about them. Um, simplestrad.com webinars is, is the way, the place to send them. Um, but uh, the more people we can get on here, the more people we can um, increase HubSpot's value for, the better for us. So uh, those are the two favors that I ask of you, and we will get into the rest of the updates. Okay, so I mentioned that I would talk about this. You can now enroll in private betas from within the portal. So the way that HubSpot releases features, not all features, but especially the big ones, come out in private beta first, and they're very selective about who they let in the private beta. There's usually a limit to, to the number of people. So think of that as more of a sort of applying to be in a beta. Public beta is available to anybody that wants to enroll that has the product mix that allows for that feature. So they've got the hub and the tier they need. 
And then live means it's already rolled out in your portal. You don't need to take any action to, to do it. So in order to find these updates, you go to your company name in the top right-hand corner in your portal, and it, it says HubSpot updates or product updates. Um, and you'll see everything is live and public beta. The new update uh, about updates for this month is that you can now see things that are in private beta there. So when it's in private beta, if you click on the update, it'll open up a sidebar at the bottom. It'll say join beta if it's a public beta, which means anybody can join. And if it's a private beta, it'll say request beta and they'll sort of add you to the list and somebody will view that and say, yep, they're a good candidate for, for this beta, which means you're, you know, you're, you're using similar tools, you've got the right product mix, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's why in, in some of these conversations uh, that we do every month, we will start to share private betas because now it's much easier to, to start to access those. A uh, couple updates around business units. So business units are an add-on if you have enterprise, they're used by companies that manage multiple brands within one HubSpot portal to easily be able to segment assets and customers. Um, and so there's a couple updates to business units that I wanted to share with you this, uh, this month. One of them, and this is one of those examples of a feature that is in private beta, you can now associate emails to business units. So this is one that has been a bit annoying if you do email marketing and have had, uh, have had business units in the past, uh, but now you can associate a business unit to your marketing emails. So you can very easily segment uh, those emails out and, and sort of find the email uh, that you wanna see. But I think even more powerful, you can also segment out the analyze tab of your marketing emails. So now you can get reporting sort of by brand or by business unit on how your email marketing is performing. And you can also now manage subscription types and statuses across business units so that if somebody unsubscribes to an email and that email belongs to business unit A, they won't automatically be unsubscribed from other brands, uh, other business units emails. So that's kind of a, a great way to just really sort of add to the separation that the customer, the HubSpot customers are seeking when they add on those business units to manage those multiple brands. You can also edit marketing emails on mobile. So we'll talk about a couple uh, new features for the mobile app. Um, so this isn't, uh, I, I'm happy they didn't do this. I think it would get really messy if you were like going in and editing like images and content of the email. You can't do that on your mobile app and I wouldn't recommend that. I think they're, they think it'd be very easy to screw things up very quickly. Uh, but the things that you can edit now from the HubSpot mobile app is subject line, preview text, from name and address, the list you're sending to, uh, the subscription type, um, and you can send from your mobile device and schedule for later. So this is great if you've got you know a couple people on your marketing team and you want somebody to review a subject line quick, or uh, maybe you forgot to schedule that email for tomorrow morning, you've already left the office. Uh, it's just a handy way for you to be able to get in there and schedule an email. So they're just trying to make it easier uh, for you to interact with some more assets. The HubSpot mobile app has been pretty limited in the past and, and we're, we're seeing them slowly start to add features that make it a lot more powerful. Speaking of mobile features, uh, there's another one this, up, or this month, which is you can now call from the mobile app from desktop. So what that means is if you are, you know, let's say you're a salesperson, you've got HubSpot open on your desktop in front of you, uh, but you want to, you know, maybe make a call and walk away, or you just prefer to, to use your phone instead of a headset or, or whatever, uh, you can click a button that allows you to make that call from the HubSpot mobile app. So you click a button, send the push notification to your phone, you click that notification, and it's going to call from the mobile app and look just like what you see on the screen here. Uh, this is going to be great, especially for teams that are running support out of HubSpot. So you can now send, they call it a deep link. So you used to be able to send a link or save a link to a thread in the conversations inbox. But let's say the email that you really, you know, let's say you, you're leaving a comment on a ticket and you want to refer somebody else on your support team or a support manager to a very specific message in that thread. And maybe that message was, you know, three scrolls up you can now actually uh, get a link and share that link to a specific message in the thread. So something that's very specific, uh, but for teams that are doing support in HubSpot, I think it's just another way that that's, that's kind of stepping up Service Hub's game, making it much easier to collaborate on those support, um, support conversations and resolving those support tickets. If you're using HubSpot payments, so this doesn't work with the Stripe integration yet, uh, that's coming. But as of right now, if you're using HubSpot payments and you're using payment links, there's a new way for your customers to pay. Uh, so it used to be just ACH or credit card. HubSpot is now adding Apple Pay and Google Pay. So uh, the more ways, I think in my opinion, the more ways you can collect money from customers, as long as those are, are quick and easy, the better. 
Uh, and so this is just a, another way to offer a more seamless buying experience to your customers uh, and another avenue for you to collect money for your business. And if you are on enterprise and you're trying to stay on top of uh, some workflows, a lot of enterprise accounts have a lot of workflows and a lot of those workflows are, are pretty mission critical. Um, HubSpot has had kind of the needs review tab for workflows for quite a while. It's allowed you to, to go in and see all the workflows that needs review, but that required you to actually go in there and check on a daily basis or a regular basis, which workflows needed review, uh, which, you know, workflow could be broken for, for quite a while before you, you go in there. Uh, and so now what we can do is as long as you have enterprise, we can set up a notification uh, on specific workflows. So it allows you to do it for those mission critical workflows um, and, and not have to do it for all of your workflows where you can get a notification for any workflow that, that gets flagged as needing review. So essentially any workflow that's having errors um, that HubSpot wants to bring to your attention, you can make sure you get real-time notifications for that. Uh, you can get those notifications anywhere. You can get other HubSpot notifications. So it depends on your notification settings for your user, but Slack, Teams, your phone, in-app, email, however you want to get those notifications, you can get them. So that's all the updates that, that we're going to talk about today. But there's two things that HubSpot have announced that they don't have a whole lot of details on that I wanted to make sure we shared with you um, because I think, uh, one, please come back. Hopefully we'll have more information on this next month or in the coming months. But two, I think they're going to unlock a lot of possibilities uh, for HubSpot customers. So the first one, this one just happened this morning. Uh, so HubSpot announced an acquisition of Clearbit, uh, which is a um, a customer data platform. Uh, so it's you know it's a, it's sort of something like Zoom Info or Apollo, uh, where you can you know look up a company and get not just you know what size of company they are, but you can figure out you know who is their CEO or who is their uh, you know who is their sales manager. Um, Clearbit also uh, is a company that offers intent data. So they can say, you know, company at uh, or a person at company XYZ is actively in the market for this type of product based on their online behavior. So there is no immediate plan for integrating Clearbit data inside of HubSpot. But I did read uh, the announcement from HubSpot CEO. Uh, they, they, they sort of published her internal announcement today. Uh, and that's exactly where they're headed. They're headed um, to be able to make intent data available in HubSpot be able to make prospecting available on HubSpot, be able to make lead enrichment much easier in HubSpot uh, without necessarily needing integration. Um, if you've been using ChatSpot for some of the prospecting features that it has, Clearbit has a potential to add a lot more value and data there. So this is an update that I think is, is going to be a huge shift for especially outbound sales motions in HubSpot or ABM motions in HubSpot. I think this is going to make HubSpot's uh, an even more valuable tool for having all of the, that data to support those campaigns. So very, very excited to see uh, how they integrate this data. I think this will this is not gonna be a one month thing. This is gonna be you know, coming out over the next, I would say probably year or two as they as they integrate these tools. So it's clear, but it's not a small company to integrate, um, but I am very excited to see how where HubSpot takes this acquisition. And the other one is, uh, there is now a integration between TikTok and HubSpot. Technically, this one is already live. Uh, it's for TikTok ads. It is, uh, it's live, but it's hard to find. Uh, so the only place you'll see anything about this is if you are already a TikTok's ads customer or, or become one, and you'll see it inside of your TikTok ad settings. Uh, so you're not going to see this in the app marketplace. You're not going to see it in the ads tool in HubSpot, at least as of right now. This is all going to be from TikTok. But really the, the thing that it supports is making it so that if you get leads from TikTok in your um, in your ad, in your TikTok ad campaigns, you can easily push those to HubSpot and, uh, and report on those and follow up with those and, and all the things that you can do. Similar if you're using like LinkedIn ads, uh, LinkedIn lead ads or Facebook link that, LinkedIn, ad, well, Facebook lead ads uh, and have those integrated with HubSpot. So um, I think the this integration is sort of in its infancy. I think you'll, we'll start to see a lot more. Um, hopefully, this is the first step towards closer integration between TikTok and HubSpot as we start to see some social platforms, who I won't name, start to fall off of consumer awareness. And and, and obviously, ones like TikTok um, are becoming more and more popular. So I'm hoping that this is the first of many updates uh, between TikTok and HubSpot. All right, next step. So my recommendations for you uh, first thing I would say is, is identify one to two updates that your team could benefit from right away. You know, I wouldn't recommend trying to implement all of these use cases right now. 
Uh, you're going to get, you're going to overwhelm yourself and the team very quickly. Find one or two from this presentation that's like, yep, that would offer a ton of value to us. Uh, identify those. Um, and we are happy to help with any of those. Simplestrat.com slash consult. Get a free 30-minute consultation. Or if you'd rather do it yourself, um, you can research those update details. So they're in that uh, product update section that I mentioned. So many of them have knowledge-based articles, especially if they're already live. Enroll in any necessary betas if you need to. Um, and then, as always, implement that and measure the impact that it's creating for your team. Please join us for our next webinars. We've got one coming up later this month. Uh, it's our Flywheel Fuel Series, which really is about how to use HubSpot to do something specific. In this case, it is generating more leads. So my partner, Ali, is going to be leading that. Uh, and then at the beginning of December, first Wednesday of December, we'll be doing this exact webinar again, covering all of the updates that came out in November. Uh, I mentioned there's already one that I'm excited about, which is Help Desk. And so I'm excited to share uh, use cases for that on December 6th. You can register for both or either of these at simplestrat.com slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Alexis to facilitate any questions we need to answer.